Welcome to this talk for the Natural History Society of Northumbria, exploring the geology and archaeology of Hadrian's Wall. My name is Dr Ian Kill and I run Northumbrian Earth, which was set up to explore the geology and landscape and all that it connects to in Northumberland and the borders. I'm currently working uh, as the community geologist for the Hadrian's Wall Community Archaeology Project and it is in this role that I will be talking today. The Wall Cap Project as it is known, works with volunteers, mostly from the communities along the length of Hadrian's Wall. It involves two projects. The first is to carry out work, including public digs at sites deemed to be at risk and in consequence on the Historic England Heritage at Risk Register, uh, and to use these digs to understand more of the condition of these sites. The aim is to find ways of ameliorating that risk and also to have an excuse to do more general archaeological work on the wall. This part of the project is essentially looking at the current state of decay of the wall. The second part of the project, and the one in which I am most involved, is the stone sourcing and dispersal project. And over the past nearly three years now, the team has been working with volunteers to understand the geology underpinning Hadrian's Wall, examining the wall stones, unearthing st the stone sources and investigating how wall stone has been repurposed. Today's talk relates to this stone sourcing and dispersal project, exploring some of the journey that the project team and volunteers have taken. One of the pleasures of this project has been the crossover uh, between geology and archaeology, and I hope that this will be of interest to you too. The cycle of birth, life and death is all too familiar to us. It's a cycle that defines us and our animal and plant cohabitees on this planet. Much of our thinking is marked out by our four score years and ten and by its graduations linked to our cultural development and political timescales. But sometimes we get clues that take us into deeper time. Here at Tynemouth, these 200 year old gravestones have been beautifully etched by the slow but persistent process of erosion. This made me aware of the power of these incremental processes when combined with lots of time. If we open our minds up to the idea of not just historical time, measured in hundreds and sometimes thousands of years, but start to talk about hundreds of thousands and millions of years, what can be achieved by these incremental processes, driven by wind, water and ice with epic amounts of time? To understand both the history and prehistory of the material aspects of Hadrian's Wall, dwelling in this deep time is essential. In this talk, I would like to dwell in deep time to trace the life cycle of Hadrian's Wall from its geological foundation through to its current state of decay and redistribution. As with any good story, the narrator needs a perspective, and I thought it would be interesting to take the point of view of one of the component minerals that make up the wall sandstone. The choice for this was obvious. What I didn't want was a character like that of Ned Stark in the wall featuring series of the Game of Thrones, who is killed in the first series. What is needed is more of a Tyrion Lannister who has gritty determination and somehow survived the entire eight series 
despite being considerably knocked about and transported all over the place. The geological character, which is a major mineral component of the wall, and can be followed right the way through this, is, this story, is quartz. Before I introduce you to quartz, let me summarise the story as a whole. Hadrian's Wall was built starting in AD 122 and had a working life of several centuries between being built and falling into disuse. Going back further, the sandstones which were used to make Hadrian's Wall are from the Triassic, Permian and Carboniferous periods and range in age between about 340 and 220 million years. However, I would like to start this story even earlier than this, when minerals incorporated into the Carboniferous sandstones were starting to form within the mountains and foreland of the Caledonian orogeny. This mountain building event created the first physical union of England and Scotland and the supercontinent of La Russia. It took place between the Ordovician and early Devonian periods, roughly 490 to 390 million years ago. This event provided the structure within which many of the sandstones used to construct Hadrian's Wall were laid down. The wall in human terms also had a long afterlife. Even now, 1,899 years on, the remains of its skeleton have the power to evoke its life and time. And part of its afterlife has been the picking over of its entrails and their revivification in newer buildings. Of these newer buildings, some are dead and ruined too, but others are still very much in use. To understand all this, and to get inside the wall and understand it is a bit like a crime scene investigation which requires a forensic examination of each aspect of the wall. One of the pieces of this puzzle is the evidence which can be gleaned from the very material the wall is made from, stone. The fabric of the wall comes from the landscape in which the wall sits and to understand the landscape and how it formed is to understand a fundamentally important part of the wall. That the wall and its fabric are durable is unquestionable. Part of the reason for this durability is down to our main character, quartz. Quartz is a fascinating and beautiful mineral. Its name derives by a high German from the Polish dialect word kwarty, meaning hard. Formed of interlocking tetrahedra with an average formula of silicon dioxide, it forms crystals which are commonly in, in, in the form of hexagonal prisms. Quartz may be coloured with the semi-precious gem types of quartz, amethyst, citrine, rose quartz, smoky quartz and others taking their colour from tiny additions of iron, manganese, titanium and aluminium. However, most quartz is clear or milky, the milkiness coming from microscopic inclusions of fluid or gas. Silica, the name used for the chemical compound silicon dioxide, of which quartz is the most common crystalline mineral, is surprisingly mobile. At temperatures above the boiling point of water, and particularly at high pressure, this highly durable mineral will readily dissolve in water. When that water moves to areas with lower temperature and or pressure, uh, or a different pH, then that silica will precipitate. One of the prettiest examples uh, of this is the way that agates form within the, the, the holes left by gas bubbles in lavas. More commonly though, this hydrothermally redistributed silica ends up crystallising as quartz in veins within metamorphic rocks or adjacent to igneous intrusions. This vein quartz is a common source of quartz which you see within the sedimentary life cycle. Another major source of quartz is from some types of igneous rock. In order for quartz to crystallise from a magma, that magma has to be, have sufficient silica in it. This means that either the magma has to be evolved, by which I mean that fractional crystallisation has taken place enriching the magma in silica, or that the magma has been created by partial melting of silica rich rocks. Both of these processes happen at destructive plate margins, for instance in the Andes, and in continental collision, for instance in the Himalayas. It is also important to acknowledge 
that a third major source of clastic material is from pre-existing sedimentary rocks. It is not only humans that go in for recycling, whereas a medieval stonemason will happily convert stone blocks from a Roman wall into the masonry needed to build a medieval church. The natural geological process will happily take a sandstone, break it into bits, transport it short and long distances and all in between into many different locations and then reconstruct new and different sandstones. Before following the journey of our main character, I would like to explore its family tree further. First of all, at an elemental level. The element silicon, which combines with oxygen to make silica, is a light element and sits immediately below carbon in the periodic table. By reading down the columns in the periodic table, we find elements which share certain traits around the way they react and combine, or don't, with other elements. Carbon is particularly interesting and could be the subject of many more presentations. As elements, it takes many forms from coal to diamond, to graphene and beyond. In combination with hydrogen, water and various other elements, it provides us with energy in the form of oil and gas and materials such as plastics, as well as being the whole basis for life on Earth, from the food we eat to what we are made of. Silicon is not as complex as carbon, but it too combines to form a massive range of materials so that just like Tyrion Lannister in the Game of Thrones, Quartz has a dynastic family. All of the minerals that fall in the slide are members of the silicate family. And many of these quartz cousins are what make up the huge variety of rocks that we see. It is these rock forming minerals which define rock types as well as defining the way that they weather and erode and are drawn into the sedimentary life cycle. So this first mineral is green olivine along with the next two uh, minerals, plagioclase feldspar and pyroxene, are the main constituent minerals of, uh, of low silica basic igneous rocks. As the silica content of magmas increase forming intermediate and acidic rocks, we see minerals like alkali feldspar, amphibole, mica, and our main character, quartz. These latter two minerals, mica and quartz, are also common minerals in the metamorphic rocks, such as mica schist, along with the next, next mineral, garnet. And finally, because I'm particularly fond of it as a mineral, here is a tourmaline, a wonderfully complex boron silicate that commonly forms in hydrothermally active uh, activity in and around the margins of igneous plutons. There are many other types of silicate, but this is just to introduce the major groups and to give an idea of the range of silicates to be found in different types of rock. Returning to granite and taking a closer look at it as one of the major sources of quartz, reveals that it is made of a great deal of alkali feldspar, the pink mineral in this polished slab of Ross of Mild granite, and also milky white plagioclase feldspar, biotite and mica, and our main character, quartz. Quartz in this granite is unusual in being smoky, and thought to be caused by small amounts of the element aluminium. More often, the quartz in granite is clear and appears a very pale gray white. Whilst granite is an incredibly durable mineral, as well as having the reputation of being hard as, when it weathers and then erodes, the difference between these interlocking minerals starts to become apparent. Biotite mica is much softer than quartz, three on the most scale of hardness, as compared to seven for quartz. Similarly, the feldspars are less hard than the quartz, at six on the most scale. But it is not just the hardness that matters. Feldspars have a more pronounced set of cleavages which make it easier for them to be broken and biotite has a very strong basal cleavage which allows it to unfurl like a book left out in the rain. Both the micas and feldspars as well as pyroxenes and amphiboles are also much more susceptible to chemical breakdown through hydrothermal activity and by weathering. The breakdown products of feldspars are clay minerals. Most well known of these clay minerals is kaolin, 
and in some of the Cornish granites where hydrothermal activity has broken down large zones of granite. A world famous supply of china clay whose principal component is kaolin has been produced. And it is the remnants of one of these massive china clay pits that has been used laterally to create the Eden project. The china clay is extracted by blasting the extraction faces with high pressure water so that the clay minerals can be separated from the remains of the granite, as principally called. These deposits of clay minerals are exceptional, but it exemplifies the way in which physical and chemical weathering will, over time, separate out the different mineral grains in source rocks. By looking at the amount of less stable minerals in a sandstone, it is possible to gain some understanding of how far and how long these mineral grains have been within the sedimentary cycle of weathering, erosion and transport. For example, a higher ratio of feldspar quartz in a sandstone might suggest that the source of these minerals is closer or proximal to the deposition location of the sandstone. Conversely, an absence of feldspar might suggest that the source is distant or distal from the sandstone's location. Along with the decomposition of the minerals, the longer they are weathered, butted by wind, bounced along riverbeds and thrashed by waves, the less angular and the more rounded they become. A look at the shape of the grain in sandstones will therefore give an additional clue as to how far and how long the grains have been within the, within the sediment transport system. Having talked about the way that minerals break down chemically and physically, it's time to give a sense of where these minerals are moving from, where they end up and how they move around. Uh, the Himalayas seems like a good place to do this for various reasons. The first, to create large volumes of sediment, large amounts of erosion are required and mountains are the place where this happen, is happening. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. What goes up must come down. Add to this ice to break up the rock, high precipitation levels and steep slopes, which promote both landslides and rapid runoffs. And you have a great conditions for sediment creation. These pictures give an idea of the massive scale of sediment production in mountain ranges. These examples are from the southern watershed of the Himalayas of the Manaslu circuit near to the Bodhi Gandaki, one of the many tributaries of the Ganges. The first shows the huge volume of rock that ice creates and transport, with material from house-side boulders down to the finest rock flour. And landslides are also responsible for an intermittent supply of plastic uh, material into the valleys. This is a bit further down the Budi Gandaki, where even high up in the mountains, river lake sediments have accumulated to significant depths. The second reason the Himalayas is a good place to look at the movement of sediment is that they're a good analogue for the conditions that prevailed in the Carboniferous period around Hadrian's Wall, with a distant mountain range created in the Caledonian erosion erogeny to the north. And Northumberland is a fallen area with deltaic sediments being fed by rivers from the Caledonian Mountains. The geology of the Himalayas is unsurprisingly complex. In ultra summary, it contains a mixture of granites, metamorphic rocks and sedimentary rocks. And as a clastic source, this provides a rich mixture of minerals. This means that the type of minerals entering the sedimentary cycle will vary at a given time depending on location in the mountain chain and over time on what rocks are progressively being exposed to erosion. To the south of the Himalayas, this sediment enters a vast network of fluvial channels which transport the sediments towards the sea. The channels themselves will be locations where sand is deposited as the channels migrate to and fro across the floodplain as the land surface subsides. Much of this sand will also debouche into the sea. This massive volume of sand is accumulating in the Bay of Bengal, uh, and some of that sand is also extensively re reworked into the foreshore environment. You will know well from exploring the Northumberland coast that after winter storms, vast amounts of sand 
may be stripped off beaches, which will then progressively be replaced in calmer weather. This continued reworking of the sand winnows and tumbles the sand grains, which results in well-rounded grains with an even size. These types of environments are very much like those encountered during the Carboniferous period in Northumberland. And here are a couple of examples of beach sand with rounded grains of even grain size and almost entirely made of quartz. Incidentally, not all sand is made of quartz. Here at Papakalea Beach uh, in Hawaii, the sand is made of olivine. This is a relatively hard mineral, albeit slightly softer than quartz. Its abundance here is due to the proximity of its source rocks, which can be seen in the background of the image. This is in contrast to the many hundreds, if not thousands of miles that the quartz grains in the Bay of Bengal may have travelled. Sediment which travels north from the Himalayan watershed enters different environments. The Tibetan plateau is more arid, and whilst there are fluvial channels, flash flooding, fan deposition, and the formation of temporary lakes are a stronger feature of the deposition environment for sand. Some of this sand will also find its way into the desert environment of Xinjiang, where wind is the dominant force for moving sand around. The combination of desert environments and movement of grains by wind leaves two distinct markers on the grain. The first is the sharply defined angles which the grains are worn into, producing triangular shapes. The second is desert varnish, which is a very thin manganese layer which forms through the interaction of clay particles with the rock grain and small amounts of evaporating water. By following the quartz, we now have a number of ways to characterise different sandstones, as well as to tell us something of their geological history, just by looking at the following. The shape of grains, the companion mineral types to quartz, the coating of grains and the size distribution of grains. And we can add to this by looking at the larger scale features produced in the sedimentary environments within which the sandstones are deposited, the different types of bedding and lamination. Here are some examples starting with uh, planar cross stratification at Howick, followed by planar cross stratification in a small quarry near to Walltown Crags. Trough cross bedding in Carboniferous sandstones at Cove on the Berwickshire coast. Massive bedding with channel structures at Browns Point in Whitley Bay. And very fine bedding plains at Lady Cross Quarry near Slately. Ripple marks on the surface plane of sandstones at Howick Haven. Water escape structures in the St. Bees sandstone at St. Bees. And Water escape structures, uh, again, in Carboniferous sandstones north of Booma on the Northumberland coast. Sandstones are not just a product of their grains and the way they are deposited. To turn sand into sandstone, the grains need to be cemented. This process of diagenesis happens progressively after the sediments have been deposited and involves the precipitation of minerals from solution as water moves through the sandstone's pores. The type of mineral and the way it is deposited within a sandstone's pores not only defines its hardness, but creates other patterns too. In this thin section of sandstone, um, the pore space has been highlighted with blue resin. The quartz grains, the pale subangular grains, um, are about, which are about 0.5 millimetres across, uh, almost all touch each other, making a grain supported structure. And you can also see where new quartz is growing over the surface of many of the grains. In this thin section of another sandstone, almost all of the pore space has been replaced by cement, and the, grains, and the grains often don't touch each other, making this a matrix supported structure. If we look at this in cross polarised light, the mottled beige colour. Uh, with added blues, greens and pinks tells us that the cement is made of calcite and not of quartz. Incidentally, you can also see a rather tatty grain of plagioclase feldspar with distinctive pyjama stripe twinning. The grains are also more angular than in their previous sandstone um, and have a wider range of grain sizes. 
Diagenesis is also responsible for some curious patterns to be found in some sandstones. In this sandstone on the beach at King Edward's Bay, Tynemouth, the patterns are caused by iron oxide precipitating in these beautiful ring patterns. These patterns provide yet another way to characterise sandstones so that they may be, if not uniquely identified, at least have it narrowed down. When trying to identify the source of a sandstone used in the construction of a particular building, a combination of these identifying characteristics may be of help. This block of sandstone used in Tynemouth Priory has a very similar grain size and grain distribution to the sandstone at King Edward's Bay, as well as having a similar colour and containing these obviously similar diagenetic iron patterns. It also just so happens that King Edward's Bay and Tynemouth Priory are really close to each other. All of these factors point to the one being the source for the other. So how can we use the information we have gleaned from following our grain of quartz from source to sandstone to help understand Hadrian's Wall from its construction through its working life and on to its progressive decay and reuse in other buildings? The first port of call is an exploration of the different types of sandstone available in the vicinity of the wall. All of the sedimentary sequences at the wall cross contain sandstones. In the east, starting at wall's end, the wall is underlain by rocks of the Pennine Coal Measures formation. And in Roman times, service outcrops of these sandstones would have been visible in the deans and banks of the time, as well as on the foreshore at Tynemouth. Traversing west along the wall, it crosses breakers through the older rocks from the Carboniferous, passing into the Stainmore Formation just beyond Hedden on the wall, the Alston Formation southwest of Cholesford, and finally passing into the Tyne Limestone Formation close to Gilsland. For much of this journey, and particularly in the central section of the wall, sandstone outcrops would have been visible to the Romans, either in river cuttings or as crags which remained upstanding after the retreat of the ice. At Lanacos Priory, just northeast of Brampton, the wall crosses into sedimentary rocks from the Permian and Triassic periods, which lie unconformably over the older Carboniferous sediments. Thin beds of the rock cran and the Eden shales of the Permian period are progressively succeeded by rocks of the St Bees sandstone, the Helsby sandstone, and the Mercia mudstone groups as you continue westward. Sandstone from these successions are often characteristically reddened, being laid down in a hotter, drier environment with the characteristics of a desert environment. However, outcrops of these rocks become progressively more scarce heading west, as the whole of the area around the Solway Basin is so thoroughly mantled in glacial till, and it is not surprising that the first incarnation of the wall beyond Bird Oswald was made of turf rather than the sandstone. The Romans were pragmatic in their approach to wall building. They brought with them a great deal of experience in quarrying methods and knowledge of how stones are dressed and how well they weather. This means that there would have been multiple factors involved in their choice of where to source their sandstones to build the wall. The quality of the sandstones and where it was available would have been fundamental. They would also have considered how they would transport the stone from the quarries onto the wall. In the central section, where there are frequent bands of sandstone which are exposed, a relatively short distance from wall, the choice may have been obvious. And here, near to Wall Town, we can still see clear signs of historic quarrying activity which have allowed for this. It may also be the case that larger quarries with an abundance of good quality sandstone may have been exploited, where it's possible to transport the stone relatively easily along the good quality roads which were built to service the wall. As just one example, the quarries at Hedden, now superimposed with huge amounts of 18th to 20th century workings, may have been able to provide such a source. In the West, where sandstone outcrops are almost completely absent, it may be that stone was transported along the wall from quarries in the Carlisle and Brampton areas. We know, for example, that there are Roman quarries in the River Gelt, where Roman inscriptions have been found. It may also be that transport by boat would have been a more efficient way of moving stone. Good quality sandstone can be found at Kirkpatrick Fleming, which could have been boated down river 
and then across the Solway. Similarly, St B sandstone may have been sourced from Maryport on the coast of the south and west, which the Romans would have known about and, been, and transported by sea around the coast and into the Solway. All of this would have been well within the Romans' capability. At this time, they were transporting single pieces of stuff weighing up to 60 tonnes from the mountains of the Egyptian eastern desert in quarries at altitudes of greater than 4,000 feet down to the Nile and then across the Mediterranean Ocean. And so the wall is built. And here at Steel Rig, we can still see an impress impressive remains running across this rugged landscape. However, the wall would originally have been much taller than it is now, maybe 15 feet or more. And the forts, mile castles and towns associated with the wall are often no more than mere foundations. This means that huge quantities of stone have now gone. In some places, the wall is conspicuous by its absence, which leaves the question, who stole the wall? Uh, and I don't know about you, but to me, these sheep are looking rather shifty. My suspicion is that they are involved in a bit of nighttime stone rustling. Other explanations are available. At places like Walltower and Crags and at Caulfields, the wall has simply been quarried away during the 19th and early 20th century. And for some 12 miles of the wall between Heavenfield, just up the road from Cholliford, right the way through to he the Heaven on the Wall. And in other sections out to Sewing Shields, the wall was used as the foundation of what is known as the Military Road. This was built in the 1750s in order to help the movement of Hanoverian troops between Newcastle and Carlisle. Wallstone is also a valuable resource. And there are a significant number of buildings adjacent to the wall what is likely that wall stone has been reused. Identifying stones as Roman is invariably challenging. In some locations, like here at Thirlwall Castle, there is a high likelihood that the castle is constructed almost entirely of Roman wall stone. This land was owned by the Thirlwall family, and in the 14th century, the original 12th century castle was significantly strengthened, forming the remains we see now. The Thirlwall family also owned the land across which Hadrian's Wall ran adjacent to the castle. In addition, there are no remains of the wall above ground in this section. This combination of ownership, easy access and the missing stone added to the distinctive shape of the stones to be found in the castle walls makes for a strong indication of a Roman source for the castle fabric. A similar argument can be made for Drumbruff Castle. The consistent size of the stonework matches that used in other parts of the wall, though in this far western part of the wall there are almost no wall remains to be able to compare what type of stone was used in constructing it. It is likely that in this area with such limited availability of stone that dress stone would have had an even higher value, uh, and that in consequence the wall stone was comprehensively robbed. It also means that buildings like Drumbruff Castle may be the only way in which some understanding of the stones used to build the wall may be better understood. Their origins from the wall in this case is emphasised by the presence of a Roman altar immediately outside the castle. Clues similar to the altar can be found at other locations. A massive Roman arch incorporated into St Andrew's Gorebridge and monolithic current columns in St Giles at Chollerton. Roman engraving in the crypt at Hexham Abbey. And cross hatch dressing, known as birching, a typical style of Roman stone dressing found at Hexham Abbey and at St Michael's Church at, at Bruff by Sands, all giving strong evidence for a Roman origin. However, in the absence of these archaeological clues, the shape and size of the stones may not be enough to be certain that the stones are Roman in origin. So here, at Lanacost Priory, as well as at the Peel Tower in Corbridge, there are stones which look like they may be Roman in their shape and dimension, but there is no corroborating evidence. This is also true of this simple medieval church, simply called the Old Church of Frampton, albeit it is built on the site of a Roman fort. For these buildings, it may be that by combining a knowledge of the geological characteristics of the stone, along with the shape, 
dimension and any other characteristics observed that it might be possible to strengthen our knowledge of what is Roman, what may be stone which has been quarried at the time of the construction. High status buildings such as churches and castles are not the only places that wall stone may have ended up. Farm buildings and walls also need stone. Stones with Roman engraving have been found in some farmhouses and there are a number of dry stone walls adjacent to the wall which have stones in them which look suspiciously Roman in their dimensions and shape. There is one further possibility for the disappearance of the wall, particularly in the west end of the wall, where the local Triassic sandstones are less durable than some of the Carboniferous sandstones, and that is erosion. We can see in buildings half the age of the wall uh, here at Lanacost Priory and Tynemouth Priory that weathering has taken its toll on the stonework. Would another 10 centuries be enough to completely weather away these types of sandstones and reintroduce our quartz grains back into the sedimentary life cycle? This I'm not convinced of. of. If for no other reason that the Romans manifestly made good choice about durable stone and that where there is remaining wall stonework looks like it's in better condition than some of the medieval equivalents. Durability was clearly of concern to the Romans and they had the knowledge of how to choose good quality stone and how to mature that stone in order to maximise its longevity. It is not surprising that it continues to have value as a building material and our hardy lead character of Quartz has had its part to play in this. Which brings me to the end of this talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about the Walkout project, uh, here is the web address. Um, there are still events going on and outputs from the project will progressively be published going on into, into 2022. And if you'd like to find out more about what Northumbrian Earth is up to this is the web address and signing up for a newsletter is the best way to keep in touch so this ends the formal presentation um, but if you have a moment i would like to read from hugh mcdermott's poem on a raised beach it is an extraordinary poem and long um, but this sort short section seems opposite to, to this talk we must be humble we are so baffled by appearances and do not realise that these stones are one with the stars. It makes no difference to them whether they are high or low, mountain peak or ocean floor, palace or pigsty. There are plenty of ruined buildings in the world, but no ruined stones. Thank you. <laughs>